Hi, everyone. My name is Margaret Rawls. I work in the programs department at Washington National Cathedral. If you're just hearing my voice, you're in the right spot. There should be an honest to God welcome screen on. We're so glad you're with us tonight and that you're joining us to welcome our very own Bishop Marianne Buddy. We'll get started in just a moment, but in the meantime, we wanted to provide some information about this evening's program. If you have any kind of technical question, if you can't hear or see, please feel free to ask for help in the chat button, in the chat screen. To see that icon, you can hover over the bottom of your Zoom window. You'll see one labeled chat. It looks like a speech bubble. We'll be monitoring that and I'm happy to troubleshoot any questions that you have. The other feature, and this is the big one that we'll be using, is the Q&A function. It's in the bottom of the screen. It's the two chat bubbles. If you have any questions for Bishop Buddy or Dean Hollerith, please feel free to put them in that Q&A function and towards the second half of the program, we'll begin to share them. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Hello, everybody. Randy Holler with here. So glad to welcome you all to another one of our Honest to God conversations. We've been uh, one of the one of the graces about uh, the cathedral building being closed is that we've been able to do far more Honest to God conversations than we're normally able to schedule when we're actually in the cathedral. So it's been a great blessing for us to hold a number of conversations, and I'm especially thrilled tonight to have our very own bishop Marianne buddy with us to have some to have some conversation bishop thank you so much for being with us great it's great to, to have you. you thank you um folks if you've enjoyed these honest to god conversations and if you're able to we would love your support you'll see a link uh a link function in the chat function of your zoom if you're joining us by way of zoom where you can contribute or and the um, a don a donate button on Facebook Live will be there as well if you're able to. But whatever the case, we're so glad that you're with us uh, today. Um, Bishop, would you start us with a prayer? Of course. Um, thank you, Randy, and and let us pray. Oh, gracious God, as we begin this conversation tonight and invite others to join in, I ask your blessing upon each and every one of us, upon all those in our circle of concern, and indeed all those um, in your uh, circle of compassion, your heart of love. We hold before you um, all those who are um, anxious and waiting and trying to discern how best to live in these times. And in particular, those who are most affected by the effects of the pandemic and our efforts to slow its spread. Be with them tonight, Lord God. Help us too, as we look toward our, um, our horizons and to the life around us to claim the blessings and the gifts that are ours to receive and that you long for us to share as expressions of your love. All these things I ask um, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Nice For those of you joining us tonight who may not um, who may not know uh, Bishop Mary Ann's bio or a little bit about it, I'm going to embarrass her and just share a little bit of it with you. Um, just so you also have a sense of, for those who may not know, sort of what the scope of being the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington entails. So uh, Marianne Buddy is the spiritual leader of 88 Episcopal congregations and 10 Episcopal schools in the Diocese of Washington. The Diocese of Washington is made up of the District of Columbia and four counties in Maryland. She is the first woman to ever hold this position. And she also serves as the chair and president of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation, which is the foundation that oversees the Cathedral, St. Albans School, National Cathedral School, and Beauvoir. Um, bishop Buddy was consecrated as the ninth bishop of Washington in 2011, and before her election, she served for 18 years 
as rector of St. John's Episcopal Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, she has a BA in history from the University of Rochester, graduating magna cum laude, and she has both a master's of divinity and a doctor of ministry from Virginia Theological Seminary. <laughs> it's so great to have you with us. Thanks just for just having some conversation. So how are you doing in the midst of all this? Um, thanks, Randy. It's great to see you. Um, I personally am well, thank you. I'm healthy and um, my family as well. Um, like everyone, uh, my heart is stretched daily and my mind is um, uh, gra struggles to grasp all that we're dealing with right now and um, and trying to discern how to live and how to lead in these times. So, you know, I have my days. I have my days when I feel just fine and life is uh, seemingly um, intact and other days when I wonder, um, oh my goodness, where where are we? What's happening? How how are we to live now? Um, I, I know that's something that you share because you and I talk, but um, trying to find our bearings in in the midst of a pandemic and our response collectively to that pandemic is unlike anything I've ever experienced. And so um, uh, so trying to discern and pray and pay attention as to what is asked of me, asked of all of us each day. So, yeah. It's a, it's a real emotional so, roller coaster, isn't it? I mean, one day I feel is. like, uh, you know, the spring is exploding all around me and the beauty right. of nature is everywhere and it feels so heartening and wonderful. And yet on, on another day or on every day actually, but on other days it hits me so hard. There's so much um, sadness and grief right and loss um, right. that's everywhere. Right, and um, some of it that touches us personally, some of it we witness via the media and um, other sources. And so um, I often, I've often had this experience in my life where I've, I feel as if um, my, my awareness of my life is somehow tethered to all that I'm not aware of, or the all that I don't, that doesn't touch me personally, but yet in somehow, somehow affects um, everything that, um, everything around me. So it's, uh, so right. Yeah, if I look out my window, it couldn't be more beautiful and more, more normal. And at the same time, nothing, you know, I, I could walk, watch neighbors walk by with masks on their faces and, um, distance between them and you just know that we're in we're in very um, very troubled times. Um, I heard our presiding bishop say when he preached here at the cathedral the last time you know there's a sickness in our land there is a sickness and it's affecting so many people and then there is our there are efforts to to respond to the sickness which is causing other forms of suffering that the circles of which just spread further and further and then there are those amazing pockets of resilience and creativity and blessedness that just make you glad to be a human being. And so it's all there. It's all there in, in, one, in one, one minute to the next. Well, uh, thank you. I know, I know so many people um, echo what I'm saying this, but thank you for your leadership during this difficult time. Um, I know for me personally, you have been um, incredibly helpful and supportive and your leadership about um, when we needed to close and the guidelines for all of that I thought was great and I know you're now working and thinking about along with the Diocese of Maryland and the Diocese of Virginia about um, about reopening and uh, right. moving the diocese forward uh, can you just talk a little bit about that one of the things that was a revelation to me as we were moving toward the regathering phrase, which is the way, which is how we're talking about it, because, you know, the church is never closed in the sense that we continue to be the church, but we couldn't gather together physically the way we long to and the way we to which we are accustomed. But as we imagine regathering, unlike the process of closing um, or of, of 
dispersing, um, which was uniform. You know, I could I could make decisions that affected everyone. And my goal was never to make never to make a decision that would not be the same for everyone under my jurisdiction. But as we come to the regathering process, what I realized, and my counterparts, our, our good friends in Virginia and Maryland realized, is that's simply not going to be possible, that the, the situations and the context in which people can come together again will vary dramatically according to geography, according to physical space, and according to capacity to abide by very necessary ongoing practices of social dis social distance and safety. And so we're looking at a process not only of phases um, collectively, but individual contexts that will vary from county to county, from neighborhood to neighborhood, from large church to small church. And um, so it's, uh, it's a process as you- Oh, I'm saying they're very and different also, in different parts of the diocese, right? Right, and and capacity, and so as oh. as um, you and I have been in conversations in other places, so many of us are looking at like four or five different contingencies at the same time. If this happens, we can do this. If this happens, we go there, <laughs> and then you know, and what are the checklists and and all of that, which is which is of course focused on people's safety and also to try and respond to the deep desire for all of us to be together again in ways that we long for. So, so that's, the, that's the journey we're on together and um, it, will be, it will be a revelation uh, each step of the way. I, can, I know you echo this, I've, I've missed the community presence, the, uh -huh. the handshakes, the hugs on Sunday morning, just the, the eye contact, I mean, Having these, these, this ability is great. And I think we're leveraging it really well across the diocese, but there's such a void there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was um, one, the Sunday, the, two Sundays ago, or the, the second, two, two times ago when I was privileged to be at the cathedral for worship. And, you know, we have such small numbers that we can have when we gather. And one of my colleagues from the Dawson staff was one of the people who was at the window was serving with us. And I saw her and I hadn't seen her in two months. And I saw her car parked behind my car. And I, it just made me cry. I just like, oh my gosh, there she is. And I, of course I wanted to hug her and I couldn't, but it was, it was such an emotional response to seeing someone that I love dearly, and I haven't been able to be in the physical space with for so long. Well, I know you miss being able to move around the diocese and visit the other parishes and yeah. do your ministry, but we've loved having you at the cathedral. That's been a blessing for us. So thank yeah. you for that. So we're, we'll come back. I know we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation. I mean, the virus sort of dominates so much conversation about so many things. I know we'll come back to that. But I really want to ask you, I really want you to share a little bit of your own faith journey. How did you end up being, you know, who you are and doing what you do? What I know a lot of people um, are probably quite interested in knowing a little bit about how God got you um, to where you are right now. Well, no one's more surprised than me. Um, I would say that um, my childhood was um, dis, disjointed. It wasn't a, um, it was disjointed because my parents divorced when I was an infant. And so I grew up in a, a kind of back and forth between my mother and my father and um, between very different spiritual and religious contexts. And <clears throat> so- Is this a, in Minnesota? No, no, no. I, I was born in New Jersey and spent most of my childhood either living in New Jersey or in Colorado. New Jersey is where my mother uh, lived and Colorado where my dad lived. Um, and I um, went back and forth between them. Um, I guess I would say that one of the things that um, happened for me is that spiritually speaking, while there was, um, there was kind of a vacuum and in that vacuum, all kinds of things could have fallen into, into it. But as it turned out, and, and I do thank God for this, I, I had really good friends at critical junctures in my life as a young person um, that introduced me to God 
and to Jesus within the context of their faith. And I, which was a very, um, uh, non it was a non-denominational or Baptist, evangelical, even fundamentalist context. But I just remember um, all of the language about salvation and about um, inviting Jesus into your heart, um, being, you know, allowing him to, all of that language, I had really no real intellectual understanding of what it meant, but I longed for whatever it was that that meant. You know, I just had the sense that that meant something really important. So I started walking toward that and surrounded by my friends in school and wound up in junior high and high school really active in an, a variety of church contexts that aren't, you know, that were in that evangelical, even fundamentalist world. And um, the, the, and I was grateful for it. And I was grateful for the structure and I was grateful for the uh, community. The, the struggle that I had, which I, which I didn't feel like I could share with anyone is that I never felt number one, that whatever was supposed to happen to me internally really happened. Like it never quite took whatever was supposed to happen that I thought other people were experiencing. And I also could never get my brain around this idea that, um, there was this very narrow path that we were on, but if you weren't on that path, your life was somehow um, condemned, right? And that was the language that was used. And those two things, that sort of sense like, I'm not sure I'm all in, but I didn't have a way to talk about that or there wasn't any recourse for it because my job now was to help other people become saved or to get in. And then the other part was, what about all these other people, including members of my own family, including my mother, who was attending an Episcopal church, which was like, any, anyway. So it was this very interesting internal tension at a time when my family life was um, about to pivot dramatically again. And, um, and to, to make a long story short, I wound up back living with my mother and this, all the other things that happened in Colorado with my dad. And I was living with my mother and who had been attending an Episcopal church. And my Colorado pastor was worried that I was going to sort of backslide into something. And I wound up um, in this Episcopal church um, and the pastor, the priest there kind of just talked to me and let me ask him all my questions and all my struggles and gave me a place in which to explore all of that. Um, and I was so grateful. And, um, and from that point on, I, um, I, I sojourned a lot as a young adult between lots of different expressions of church, but I always wound up coming back to the Episcopal church and I'm not quite sure why it was I often liken it to like middle C on the piano. I just kept on coming back. And um, while I, I had the sense that being a priest would be really amazing. Um, I'm old enough that by when I was thinking about vocational things, there just weren't that many women in the ordinate, you know, there just weren't that many women. And I never felt particularly, um, you know, that sense of like never quite having enough was always there. So I would say that everything about my ordination from the very beginning all the way to where I am now has been nothing short of uh, a gift to me um, that I would be allowed to walk this walk and to, to be in this role. When did you know that you were called to the priesthood? Well, um, no, of course, is a strong, strong word. I first felt a desire when I was in college, um, but this was back in the day when um, there was a real bias against younger ordinands. Uh, and, I, I, I was there. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. And um, and I and I also was I was I was pretty troubled as a young adult. I mean, I had a lot. I had a lot to deal with. But I wound up um, I wound up uh, working for the Methodist Church for a couple of years as a domestic missionary. I did that right out of college. Um, and I loved working for the Methodist Church. And I was down, it was in Tucson, Arizona, and I was doing social justice work then, which is a whole other story of how I kind of fell in with both radical Roman Catholics and progressive Methodists working on issues um, of justice. 
But as, as I was there, I realized that this sense of like answering the call and answering it in this church where I had felt such a strong resonance of home just wouldn't go away. And so I thought, well, I'm just gonna knock on the door. I'm just gonna try. And um, so 24, I wound up in seminary um, back in the mid eighties. And uh, that's, that's how it started. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think that's- Yeah, uh, the other thing I'll say with, the other thing I'll say with- the is, subtitle. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I just say, I love the subtitle. I backslid all the way into the Episcopal church. Well, there was that, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, did I ever. And, um, and, and more than once, I'll say, but the, um, and you know, I, I, um, I love the Episcopal church and I love, I love it enough to be really frustrated with its mm. um, blind spots and vulnerabilities and, I spent enough time in my really formative years in other faiths, in other faith traditions. As I said, I worked for the Methodists. In college, I worshiped with Catholic workers and sort of radical progressive side of the Catholic church. I was, and this was during the, the Central American wars, right? When people were dying for their faith in Central America. So I've lived kind of, I, I, in a very short period of time, I, I saw kind of the breadth of Christendom and the Episcopal Church had this little tiny spot on it with, with a few gifts and a lot of um, things that they were missing, uh, we were missing. And so I've never ever felt like we were the only, you know, I just always have felt that we do better when we, we don't compare the strengths of one tradition against the weaknesses of another, right? Like we all have something that God, um, God, I, I pray um, God is using for, for good in the world. Um, and this just happens to be for whatever reason, the lane that I found myself in. And to my amazement, because I always thought I would be on the edges of the church, I, I, I discovered I was actually pretty good at um, life at the center, you know, as a fairly traditional leader, you know, first as a rector for so many years and then now as bishop, so surprises all the way around. Well, thank you for sharing that. And you know, you bring up the justice work and uh, uh, how do we, you know, so one of the, I think one of the questions you and I were talking about the other day is how do we, how do we keep that work going in the light of COVID-19? You know, how do we make sure that we're, we're keeping what's essential, essential, you know, that caring for the poor, the less fortunate, uh, standing up for justice. And, and we, I mean, the COVID-19 has revealed so much, even, even more about the disparities between rich and poor, between people of color, and, um, and there is so much justice work to be done. How do we keep that going when we're all stuck in our homes, so to speak, you know? Uh, well, you, you've, you've said a lot right there. And, um, you know, the first thing to say is that the disparities were always there. We always knew where they were there, but now they're just screaming at us at every turn. Um, I, would, I would gently add that um, the Episcopal Church is not immune to the, um, to the disparities that you described. So within the Diocese of Washington, there are, um, the majority of our churches are predominantly white and, um, and, and maybe half of them are doing okay in the context of this, of this crisis. But the congregations that are in poorer areas or are in multicultural communities or are in fact um, surrounded are in fact uh, populated by the most vulnerable, they are they are struggling in in some of the most poignant and um, and um, heartbreaking ways. And so it's not as if there's like these people over there um, and us. But it's it's like our we're it's part of our our family our world our our diocese. Um, so in terms of responding, I think the the frust the the frustration that we've all been feeling is um, the um, the limitations of what we can do in the context of social of, of the stay at home orders and 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 so many of our ministries have been con confined or redefined by the. Uh, by the safety issues that we've been discussing. Um, activism is really hard when you're working on a computer and 
<laughs> and confined to your home, right? All of those things. Um, I would say, and this is this is just me that, and this is not a, really an answer to your question, but this is how I'm coping right now, is that um, I want to make sure that we preserve the foundational, um, the foundations of our churches. Um, because I do believe the local church is the hope of the world. And I do believe that the local churches are the places where the transformative work of the gospel take place. I just believe that. And that, um, and so my goal is to ensure that as many of our congregations in the most, where, where ministry is most needed, are uh, keep going, that they just keep going and that we do whatever we can to support them in this time. Um, and then at the same time, um, do what we can to put before our elected leaders and those who are um, you know, holding the levers of society, just putting before the, um, the disparities that you mentioned, that we just have to keep on doing that in whatever ways we can. Um, and as you and I have talked about in another context, and I don't mean to, I, I, this is not a partisan comment, this is just a reality, that um, churches cannot take over the functioning of, a, of the federal government that we actually need an effective and um, and responsive federal and local government, and so if that we just have to insist on that 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 is that as civic members of this society we are we as demo, as, as participants in a democracy we have to ensure that our governments are in fact responsive to the realities that we're dealing with. So. I don't have answers, but that those are the those are the realms in which I, I my brain um, tries to imagine what we're called to do. Amen yeah. to that. And, and, and I know and, we're and gonna, we're gonna the, go. And respond to, well, I was just gonna say then responding to the carnage of suffering, right? Um, and doing whatever we can, um, whatever we can in whatever ways we can, um, and holding up the people. Who are um, who are so important to the um, to this whole process? And I know there's a lot of creative ministry going on around the diocese right now. You know, even when we're when we're shut down, I'm talking to some of my colleagues. It's it's yeah. inspiring to hear some. Yeah, of those and not and everywhere really. I mean, everywhere. There's just a um, <clears throat> there is um, there is. I think one of the things I, I find hope in is um, one of the things that's happened is that it's. Um, do you know when you've got a really big, a really big issue to deal with, it kind of clears the deck of a lot of really less important issues that we're all consuming at a different time, and this puts them in a different perspective, and um, and so I pray that one of the things that come comes out of this for all of us. And I'm not just speaking about the church, but because you and I are church leaders, it, it's sort of like our lane, right? But all of us, it's like, what's important and what's not? What, um, what is of value and what isn't? Where do we spend our resources for things that matter? And where are we just wasting our lives, right? And where are we collect, where, what have we collectively allowed to happen because we didn't have to think about it? And now, because we've seen it for what it is, um, we just won't find it acceptable anymore, right? I mean, I just think all of those things are the opportunity that God is giving us through this horrible, horrible um, moment of suffering for so many, and you know, and shame on us if we don't if we don't do our best, our imperfect best, to respond to the moment in ways that not only transform us and the church, but the society in which we live. It's that it's really that hope. It's the hope of what the new normal might be. Yeah, yeah. And and to look back to our, you know, if you look back on any phase in history, these sort of pivot moments, it's it's always clear that I mean it's always clear looking back that nothing, you know, there's nothing that was ever done perfectly. And there are always, there are always, you know, compromises and missed opportunities and missteps, but you also see sometimes a really pivotal transformation that arises out of crisis that, you know, upon which now our lives depend, but at the time was just this impossible idea. Mm. And I, you know, I see that and I, and I see small glimpses of it in, um, 
you know, in, in, in the world that I live in, which is, you know, the world of the church where victories are measured in smaller ways, but nonetheless may point to some of the larger patterns that God is placing before us. We're going to go to questions from folks. I know we've got a lot of questions coming in in just a minute, but sort of to build off this, um, as as Bishop, you travel some around the uh, country and uh, House of Bishops and other meetings, and you have colleagues I know that you're close with around the country. What are what are some of the um, what are some of the things you're seeing around the church? that really sort of give you hope or you find inspiring um, or, or hopeful? Are you seeing things that, I mean, cause you're, you're doing some, you're really doing some great leadership within the diocese about uh, the parishes or the cathedral, all of us sort of uh, claiming some of the essence of our ministry in, in evangelism and clarity of thinking and, and, and the work that you've done with the strategic plan. Uh, so I'm just wondering, what are some of the things that you're seeing around the church that give you energy? Maybe that's the way to put it. Yeah, I, it's a great question. I, I feel I'm always inspired by um, <clears throat> leaders or communities that um, claim hopefulness and joy in the midst of the world that we live in, which without, without, you know, turning away from suffering, but claiming and really embodying the good news, the, the real, the real, truly good news of the gospel in ways that are life giving and, and transforming. So whenever I see that, I'm like a moth to light. I just want to learn more, just want to see more, all of those things. And so that, that's one thing. I mean, and, there, and there are examples of that large and small everywhere I go. Uh, the other thing that I think is um, so hopeful in this time, and in some in some ways, I've been waiting for it my whole life, which is those moments when, when you realize you're living in a time that it, that others might look back on someday and say, "Well, what did you do then? What 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 change? You know, how did you respond?" And to be able to say, "I want to be one of I want to be on the edge of those." I, I just, I just am so inspired by the people who look, who lean into that possibility and say, okay, what are we doing now that we don't need to be doing anymore because it's not needed anymore? So what can we let go of? What do we have now that is life-giving, but it needs to change because the context around us has really changed. And what new thing is, what, what can we, what can we do that's like completely, was, was even, we hadn't even thought about it even, you know, just two months ago. And just to live into those three questions all the time. And whenever I hear or see people doing that, I just get so, I just get filled with so much hope. And I wanna be with, I wanna be there, you know? I'm not always there myself, but when I see others, they give me courage. And I think, okay, that's, that's, that's where I wanna be, right? And I see that at the cathedral. I've loved hanging out at the cathedral with you all. And I've seen the way you've leaned into this and I've seen it in other places. And I, I, um, I, I, I find that, you know, that's, that's what's going to last, you know, that's, so it's not just getting through this time, but how we get through it and what we learn and how we allow ourselves to be changed. And, um, Gives me a sense that God is is God is with us. You know, we're not we're not doing this alone. Well, we appreciate the way you lean into things and help us to do the same. So thank you for that. Of course. Um, I know we got some Michelle. I know we got some questions. I can see the chat box just going crazy over here on the side. So I'm gonna invite you to come in and uh, let's take some give the bishop some questions. Yeah. Hey, folks. Um, so glad to be here. I actually, we've, so we have a number of questions that were submitted ahead of time. We've got some that are coming in right now. Um, one of the ones that was submitted ahead of time, actually several of them take this conversation you were just having one step further into, are there things that you are seeing now that are life-giving that we would want to continue, right? What are we learning in this moment? that can, we can carry into whatever comes next? Um, it's, a, it's really, it's a great question. Um, a couple of things that have um, come to light for me just in the, in the last few days. I think um, the first thing I would say is that 
virtual space is not to be contrasted with real space or real encounter, right? It's all real. Like what we're doing right now is real. It may be, we're not in the same room, but we're in a real space and a real encounter. And more and more of our people um, and the people of the world are moving, are, are finding their way in this space. And we as Christians and Christian communities are, are belong here. And we're part of a church that was slow to embrace that. You know, a lot of our brothers and sisters and other traditions have been in this, have had this realization for years and we have been much slower. And I think one of the things that we're learning is this is, this is good. This is good for us to do. It doesn't replace physical, um, physical gathering, but this is real church and real community. And we need to keep that. The other thing, which I, which is sort of the exact opposite, which is kind of all the low tech stuff that is so important. Like I was talking to one church, one church group today, and they said, "Yeah, we started a phone tree. Remember those, right? You know, when some, you know, like they, they just took the directory and said, okay, Michelle, you get the first ten, and Randy, you get the second ten, and I'll take the third ten, and and we're just going to call everybody and see how they're doing, right? And what people are discovering is because they're home right now." They want to talk, right? So there are all these connections, but they're like one-on-one -on -one personal things, right? So those are two. And then the third thing I'll say is um, we have allowed ourselves as a society to um, disparage and to under undervalue the people who we now recognize keep our society running, right? all the people who are paid really poor wages with no benefits and who are responsible for all the intricacies of connection that keep our food supply going, that keep us in the, the, the daily, just everything we need for daily life, as well as keeping the key institutions upon which our lives depend going. And so we are now seeing how indispensable all of those intricacies and connections are, which we have allowed ourselves to ignore and God forbid we come out of this without some social reckoning that allows for greater equity and fairness and decency for the people who, are, who pick our vegetables, who get them to market, who drive the trucks that move them from one place to another. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, that these, and we, we collectively have just rendered these people um, invisible and they are front and center now. And we have an opportunity to make some things right that have gone wrong for way too long. So those are, that's like my, this is my top five right there. And that is a perfect setup for one of the questions that we got from Julie that I really wanna ask, um, which is about preparation for, for the time um, that is coming. So I'm gonna read this cause it's so well written. How do we prepare for the overwhelming need in our midst when the immediate danger of the pandemic has passed? What do we right. need to do now spiritually so that we can be fully present to the suffering and fully able to help? How will we keep a sense of urgency and compassion alive? Wow. Um, the only way in my life that urgency and compassion stay alive is I, if I am proximate to the situations that um, of suffering or of inequity, right? And, um, and what this pandemic has done is has brought so much of that disparity kind of right into our realities. Not just, we, we know that they're there, but these are the people that our lives depend upon, right? And so I, I, I think what the temptation will be when the crisis passes is to, is to forget, right? To go, to go back to some, um, a, to attempt to have some sense of like, well, we don't have to think about that anymore. And, and you know, and to be honest, that's going to happen, right? That's human nature. There, some of that will happen. Part of the uh, invitation is for us to keep before us what we've seen because it takes a certain amount of effort to, to stop seeing once you've seen something, right? Um, and the prophets, the biblical prophets warn us about that. Like if you've seen something and then you choose to look away, 
if you know something and then you choose not to know it anymore, that takes a lot of psychic energy and a lot of, you have to really tamp down that. And it, and it leads to all other sorts of behaviors that just aren't healthy. But if we're willing to face the pain and to face our own complicity in it and to make amends, we open the possibility of, of transformation. And I feel like um, that will be, and, and we and whatever that is, Michelle, I think we have to start doing it now. Like we can't wait until this this is over. We have to start now. Um, in ways large and small, we have to start now to be that to bring that new reality into into being. You know, I think, and, and I'm gonna be just if you don't mind, just add something. Please. You know, one part Please. of it was how do we how do we prepare spiritually now in some sense for it. And right. I just know for me, I, I fear, uh, you know, life's so crazy right now. And there's so many things that are up in the air and so much that has to be planned and done and, you know, institutions to run and all of that. I worry that if I don't spiritually take the time and the energy to actually grieve the, the not only the death and the loss, but of course that, but also this disparity and the injustice of it and the suffering of those, of so many who don't deserve that suffering. If I don't, if I don't give myself some space to really grieve and, and confront that, I'm afraid I will push it down. And, and what, and the way we, we have to prepare ourselves spiritually is not to push it down, is to keep it to keep it in our hearts and and to because I think that in my own life that which touches me emotionally the deeper something touches me emotionally the more willing I am to carry that thing and do something about it in my future right yeah, that's really well said Randy thank you and what I also there's so many good questions and we're not going to get to all of them but this one in particular there's so much wisdom that we see in the questions I just really want to invite people to put your own responses for what your preparation now looks like in Facebook or in Zoom just share what you're doing right mm -hmm. um, because I would love you all are already doing much of this and if you're watching and you're not sure what to do the people sitting figuratively right next to you are doing something so so please continue to to share with one another in in writing and um, that's one of the gifts of this platform i think um oh, randy you, you you touched on something that we had several questions come in about and that's the topic of grief and of loss and some of the there's some question about there's how do we how do we reach out to uh, to other people when we're we're isolated and we know that people are grieving a variety of different things how might we stay in touch with them there's a question about how do we without feeling selfish how do we acknowledge personal loss that might not actually be connected to the pandemic we people life goes on right the the, the losses that happen even without this virus are are still there and and are we're dealing with them in a different context and in a different community. So if y'all can speak a little bit more to helping cope with loneliness, helping cope with grief, helping manage our ways through that. Right. Um, well, I'll just give you an example. I mean, I'll just give you a sense of what it's like for me personally is um, I have found myself of late um, I'm, I'm I'm losing interest in uh, in terms of my own life. I'm losing interest in in sort of that self condemning speech that says, "Well, you shouldn't feel that way," or you know, your grief isn't as important as other people's grief, or you know, all of those 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 things, right? So I find myself now simply holding that before God and asking God to do what God does to transform not just not just the circumstance but to, to change me right so i and i have a spiritual director who often asks me that question you know how is god using this to expand your heart right which is a really wonderful question but to simply hold it and not to pretend not to pretend that it doesn't hurt not to pretend whatever the it is not to pretend that i don't feel it um but to say 
at this stage in my life, I don't know that this is, I don't know that this is going to change or this is gonna go away, but I'm asking you God, not only to carry it, help me carry it, but help me be changed as a result of it. Like, don't, I don't want this to, I, it's like that, that my, one of my favorite lines in scripture is when the, the prophet, the patriarch Jacob says, I won't, I won't let you go until you bless me, you know, with the angel that he's wrestling with, this, this stranger in the night who's like taking him down and like, I'm not going to let this go. And so how can we not let these things go without um, allowing God to help us find the blessing? costly blessing, a blessing that we would never choose of, as a result of the suffering. If we could go back and not have the suffering, we'd do that in a heartbeat. But if we don't have a choice, let's not, I don't want it to be wasted. I don't want it to make me, so those, that's what I would say. I, I don't know if that's a comprehensive answer, but that's where I, that's where I, my, my first thought. So I'll, I'll pitch it over to you, Randy, and you can, you can it's funny, just from a very personal point of view, um, my, my prayer life, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an eclectic prayer life guy, you know, sometimes it's daily office, sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes it's journaling, sometimes it's um, my spirituality is rather Ignatian, I like to do the examine some of the Jesuit practices, but I noticed that um, in recent weeks, um, my prayer life had really dried up. Mm -hmm. It had really gone very barren, and um, I couldn't figure out why. Well, I mean, I, I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about it. I just noticed it. And then I realized that, really, quite frankly, I was angry. <laughs> I was angry. I was angry at the death and the loss. And, the, you know, what did Naughty Boats want, Weber say the other night? The, we had hoped, you know? We had hoped, right. On the road to Emmaus, you know, they had hoped. You know, we had hoped so much and things just blew up and I found myself angry. And um, when I admitted that, then I knew that that was like, you know, the stages of grief, right? It was really the first taste of a grief that I needed to own personally. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm finding my, my own spiritual life opening up somewhat by, by just allowing myself to hurt. Yeah. So much. I am um, sorry. I got caught up in listening to you all. So, <laughs> I am... the, the the terrain of grief is um, is both very particular and it's communal, mm -hmm. and it's not. Um, while there are stages, um, and it's helpful to know that it even those who have conceived of those stages don't encourage us not to think of that as a linear experience, but one that circles back and forth. And um, both of you know that um, my mother is living with me now and she's been through a lot in this past year. And just in these last few days, I've, I've watched her as she's circling back around, trying to figure out what on earth happened to her life, right? What on earth happened? This has nothing to do with the pandemic, just her own illness. And it's, it's just, I, I just listening to her, I realized, you know, when you've been hit with something that just, like you said, just in your in a moment changed your life, you just keep circling around it and trying to understand it. And um, I think the grace is the miracle is that as a species we we do carry on and we do find, um, if not in ourselves, then in those who come after us or those that we've passed something on to, something of that life spirit can carry <laughs> on and. You know, again, I'm old enough now to know that it's, some of it will include me in the future and some of it won't, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 and so what is the, what is my, you know, in the time I have left here on this earth, what, what is, what is uh, given, what is taken away, what is asked, what is offered. It's, uh... Thank you. I'm, I, I've circled around. So I'm, I have, there's two more questions that fit together a little bit uh, that I think that I'll, I'll put on the table for both of you at once. And then Randy, when those questions have been answered, um, why don't you take the reins again and, and close this out for the evening if that works. So- Let me just stop and say, I should have done this to begin with, but 
For everyone who doesn't know her, this is Michelle Dibley, the director <laughs> of programming at the cathedral, and a great blessing to many of us. I'm sorry, Amen. Michelle, but I did not introduce you appropriately when we started. Bye. Thank you. So a couple questions. This one's come up a couple of times. You've answered it a little bit. If you want to add to it, are there spiritual practices that you are um, that are helpful to you right now? If there's anything you want to add to the things that you both have already been quite forthcoming about about what your prayer lives are like, what else that you're, you're doing. And then the other one uh, is about what um, the question came in early on about recommendations for books whether that's something you're reading now or clearly both of you have really rich spiritual lives and if there are recommendations of authors or books that you would want to name and i'll just say there's a really beautiful poem that was put into the um the q a that i'm not gonna read it's by bonnie thurston and i'll drop it into the chat and okay. we'll make sure to include it in the email that goes out afterwards. So Margaret Rawls, who does all of that support work, Margaret, let's make sure we grab that so we can send it out because it's just, it's beautiful. So so reading recommendations and or um, any additional practices, spiritual practices that are, or other practices that you're finding helpful that you can share with us. The practice that I am coming back to over and over again is, um, and then it's a constellation of practices, but it's um, it's whatever I can do to find a sense of peace in my body. And so sometimes that's walking, sometimes it's um, um, yeah, sometimes it's going out for a run, sometimes it's sitting, but something that allows my spirit to, to feel its embodiment. And if I can, if I can help, if I can bring into some kind of alignment, my inner life and how I'm feeling physically, I have a better, I'm more able to both be present to other people and to listen in ways that, um, that allow me to hear in however however God may be present for me. So it varies from day to day, but that's the um, that's the that's the goal. So that's just trying to pay attention to that. Um, I find that my attention span is less these days for concentrated anything, but I have found touching base with the daily lectionary, the, the biblical readings for appointed for the day, for some reason um, have been really powerful for me. We just got finished with a whole section that were all the wilderness passages from you know Moses leading the people out of the promised land. And it just couldn't have been better. Mm. Right. And and then also the, you know, the it's just funny how sometimes there's just it just so happens that the texts are really, really powerful. So those two things have been helpful for me these days. Randy? For me, I think, um, you know, when my, when my prayer life dried up for those weeks, and I have to admit it's still pretty dry now, but when it dried up for those weeks, I just kept hearing Annie Lamott in my head, you know, the, the two most fundamental prayers in the world are help me, help me, help me, and thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. And yeah. sometimes, and I think folks need to give themselves permission for this, sometimes our prayer life you know, it's sort of limited to that, to those two basic things, and mine certainly was for a while. Um, I return over and over and over again uh, to uh, journaling. I find the journaling a very prayerful and spiritual exercise for me. It's a dialogue with myself. It's a dialogue with God. I, I write things that surprise me, you know, sometimes. I try to free write when I do it, and not, not like sermon write, but just just put it all out there. No one's ever going to see it. It's just for me and God, but I, I find that it opens me up and um, it makes me listen and pay attention um, to what's, what's coming back at me, I think, from, from the Holy Spirit. Oh, and the second question is, what are we reading? And I have to confess, I am not reading anything um, uh, churchy or spiritual at the moment. Quite frankly, I'm having a lot of fun reading uh, Chernow's biography of George Washington. Huh. The only problem is that it's a huge tome, and I'm reading it on my iPad, and it seems like no matter how much I read, it says you're 32% done in the book. 
<laughs> but I'm actually finding, you know, if you talk about Valley Forge and some of the horrors of the revolution and the struggles they had, I sort of spend an hour reading, put the book down and go, well, wow, my life's not that bad. <laughs> what do I have to complain about? Um, I, I'll just say, I won't necessarily share a book, but one thing I've, I've done, I'm actually really tired. I, I find that I'm really tired of screens. And so I'm, 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 I'm looking for books now, not, not my Kindle. And so what I'm doing is I'm like kind of walking through my house and looking at my bookshelf and picking up books that I have read before or that I bought and hope to read someday. And I'm just kind of dabbling through them for the ones that speak to me. And I've come, I've, I've found a few real surprises, things that, you know, just that, you know, but anyway, just kind of looking through my own collection of assorted books and picking them off the shelves and just seeing seeing where they land. So Randy, over to you. I want to say a quick thank you to Margaret Rawls and Caitlin Toner and Hannah Phillips who are helping us out tonight on Facebook and in Zoom. You aren't seeing their faces, but you're seeing their handiwork in every moment that we are on the screen. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Bishop Marianne, for being hey, with Wendy, us It's tonight. great to be with you. Yeah. Taking the time. It's, um, it was a gift to have you, and thank you for your willingness to share and, and be with us. Well, and Randy, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, it's great to be with you in, in everything and everything. So take good care of yourself. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Um, I'm, th I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us. God bless you all. Please stay safe. And if you'll allow me, I would love to end with um, a prayer that's one of my favorites, and I know it's one of Bishop Mary Ann's favorites because she prays it qu quite often, um, a prayer uh, for Saint, prayer of St. Francis. So uh, let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye.